said to her, but I'm curious, why are you doing this? You know, putting your own life at slight risk, your health at risk. And she looked at me and I'll never forget what she said. When she said to me, why am I doing this? The question is, how could I not do this? And to me, when you ask me the question of remembering a moment when you woke up to life, literally, that conversation with Aunt Paula awoke me, awakened me to a true understanding of what it means to be alive and to love and to give. And I would say to some small degree, ever since, and I, I wish that I could say to a greater degree, um, but to some small degree, that moment has changed my life, and I've tried ever since then to look for opportunities to be even a little bit as giving as Aunt Paula was in that profound moment of love, giving literally the gift of life. Welcome to another episode of Waking Up to Life with Rabbi Josh, a podcast built around conversations with people in the community who have found a bit of enlightenment in their lives through experiences. While these events may not seem life-changing to you, the conversation may just reveal how those moments shape the way my guest sees the world. It's an informal conversation with friends and family and insights from Jewish tradition, and it may just change your life as well. And if not, it's just 18 minutes with me. So l'chaim, to life. Today on the podcast, we welcome a very special guest. It's a special guest because Rabbi Jim Bennett, who is one of the spiritual leaders of Congregation Sher Emeth in St. Louis, Missouri, happens to be also my brother and therefore the only and oldest living person in the world right now who has known me for my entire lifetime. So, Jim, welcome to the show. It's great to be here, Josh. It's a little bit dangerous for me to have you on the show because you know so much about me and you may reveal more than what we've talked about in order to uh, share a little bit more with my guests, but I'm hoping you'll, you'll protect me from that disaster. You're safe because turnabout is fair play and I know it. For sure. Well, I'm so glad you're with me. Uh, you and I have prepared for this moment, and, and I know that we have uh, a shared experience in the death of our mother prematurely to uh, kidney disease. But uh, what's special about that was a connection we had to Aunt Paula, and I know you had an experience with her that will be the basis of our conversation. So share with uh, my guests today, or with my audience what uh, that story is. Thanks, Josh. It's, you know, it's one of the most amazing and transformative moments of my life, which at the time seemed relatively trivial, but it was back in the late 1980s, around 1986, 87. I, I actually don't remember the exact date, but it doesn't matter. As you and I and everybody in our family remembers, mom was very, very sick and uh, had come to the point in her progressive kidney disease that she really needed a kidney in order to survive. Uh, and was a, a candidate, uh, surprisingly, given her relative advanced age uh, for kidney transplant. But very quickly, when that question of becoming a kidney transplant recipient came up, we remember that our beloved Aunt Paula, mom's mother, youngest sister, stepped up and volunteered to donate one of her kidneys to mom. And uh, I, I know we were all overcome with incredible gratitude and and just love and relief all wrapped up in the same. But the moment I wanted to share quickly was the moment the night before mom's surgery, when mom had been admitted to the University of Chicago Hospital and Aunt Paula had been admitted. And it was the night before, early the next morning, they would go in for surgery. And I stopped by to visit mom and she wanted to sleep. And so I stopped by uh, Aunt Paula's room as well and was had the really the beautiful opportunity to be alone with her for just a few minutes and we chatted and I asked her if she was afraid and she said no and I and I just said to her well I just want to say thank you um, for this gift you're about to give your sister my mom our mom and yourself and I said but I just curious and you know I was a young rabbi a little impetuous uh more so than now, I guess. And I said to her, but I'm curious, why are you doing this? You know, putting your own life at slight risk, your health at risk. 
And she looked at me and I'll never forget what she said when she said to me, why am I doing this? The question is, how could I not do this? And to me, when you asked me the question of remembering a moment when you woke up to life, literally that conversation with Aunt Paula awoke me, awakened me to a true understanding of what it means to be alive and to love and to give. And I would say to some small degree ever since, and I, I wish that I could say to a greater degree, um, but to some small degree, that moment has changed my life. And I tried ever since then to look for opportunities to be even a little bit as giving as Aunt Paula was in that profound moment of love, giving literally the gift of life. Yeah, it's an amazing memory for me as well. I was much younger and uh, a decade younger than you obviously came about that moment from a very different perspective. But I remember thinking to myself how lucky we were to have someone in the family as others were waiting on long lists of donations uh, to, to get a, a, lip, a kidney to, to really move to the next stage of mom's life. I also remember watching mom wake up in those first days and uh, as one of the very first patients to take cyclosporin was experimenting with doses and equally miraculous was the fact that doctors could actually perform that surgery and had the technology to be able to keep somebody from rejecting a, a, an organ like that. I, I wonder, as you think back on it, how has it affected the way you serve others as a rabbi? Because obviously you, you're with other patients now who aren't your family in exactly the same circumstances. Yeah, well, there's the literal answer to that question, which is when I have the opportunity, like you, I'm sure, to more often than, than not to be with families who need organ transplants or who are making the difficult decision about whether to give an organ to another family member or even to allow their deceased relatives' organs to be used to save other lives. There's the literal learning that I take away from that, which is the critical importance of the gift of life, of, of organ transplantation, of, of everybody who's able to sign to be an organ donor, you know, and all that literal stuff. But for me, the reason I brought this waking up to life segment to you today was more the way it's impacted me in non-literal ways, because there's the obvious connection to organ transplantation and trusting science and the miracle of science. But to me, the, the more fundamental thing that I loved about remembering this story, and I was so grateful when you asked me this question for this podcast, it just reminded me that we get all caught up in the, the chaos and the nonsense of our lives. But ultimately, I believe, and I believe more than ever as a result of that memory of Aunt Paula and our mom, I believe that we are here to give to others and to care for others. And at a time when the political realities and everything swirling around us tells us that that's not important, I just think it's so important to be giving and caring and loving. And that in some small way, and I don't wanna pat myself on the back, I don't think I'm such a great giving person, but I believe that we should strive to be great and giving and good in that same way. And so for me, Aunt Paula is like one of my teachers of Torah. She, her, the Torah of Aunt Paula, not even hesitating about giving the most precious thing she had to give to save her sister's life. To me, that's metaphoric for what we should all do in much smaller ways, just the simplest things that, that are so easy to do. Like we don't have to go to the hospital and have somebody cut out our kidney right? We could just be giving and caring. Yeah, you know, I think that's obviously a global truth, but it has actually, in a strange way, impacted our own nuclear families as well. We've both raised our own children to have beautiful relationships inside our nuclear families, and thankfully our children love each other and have relationships within our individual families, but I've been lucky enough to have all three of your kids come to live for a time period in, in our home, which has allowed us to have both pieces of our family, despite living across the country from one, each other, from one another, to have that connection. And I wonder if just a piece of that, I, you know, obviously I, I welcomed and, and lovingly welcomed your kids into the home, but I wonder if a part of that just comes from the experience that we had of watching 
our mom and our aunt have that kind of selfless relationship. You know, we can, we can make fun of each other and have fun with each other all the time. But when push comes to shove, my kids know yours are there and your kids know mine are there. And that has been a remarkable experience of these last 15 years or so as our kids have gone from being children to being more young adults. Yeah, I and I, I share that and I would echo it. And I'm grateful not only for the literal you know, kindness and generosity that you and Meg have shown to my kids. They, they do love you guys. And even though we don't see each other nearly as often as we wish we did because of geography and time and all that, um, I, I think you're right. I think that we, when I reflect back, we learned by many examples, but by this most profound example and memory that I share with you um, about what it means to be family and all literally that that bond that is so powerful that you'd be metaphorically or literally willing to give one of your organs to the other if necessary because that's what family is and and i think that expands even beyond family as well to just that's what community is so i i don't want to go into the political realm because it's it's never a fruitful oh, company why not? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so challenging, but we are living in a time when maybe kindness and the, the kind of generosity that you're talking about has become less obvious. Are you seeing a, a, a reaction to that, a change in the St. Louis Jewish community right now in terms yeah. of sort of reacting back as, as we sort of ricochet out of a really challenging time period in, in humanity? I've just I've just really started trying to put my my brain around this and to really uh, conceptualize it. I want to be careful because I don't actually believe that most people, regardless of ideology, politics, beliefs, whatever, are actually selfish or self-interested. I think that this reality we've been living in has brought out that and made it seem as if there's meanness on one side and kindness on the other. And I don't think that's true. I mean, I know that people of all places on the political spectrum are capable of kindness and actually value kindness. In our community, I think you're right that there is across the country, and I'm seeing it here, sort of a, almost a ricochet, kind of a, you know, a boomerang back towards like a craving for kindness in spite of our political tensions and difficulties because more and more of these extreme examples of mean spiritedness are not representative of the majority of people in any political ideological place within the Jewish community and outside it. Like most people, I don't know, what did Anne Frank, I still believe, Anne Frank said, I still believe that most people are actually good at heart. I actually do believe that. I really do. I don't think that's the naive meanderings of a little adolescent girl. I think that that she was speaking a truth. Most people actually are good at heart. And when push comes to shove, I believe most people will will go there. Yeah, and I think that to tear away the veil uh, that we all wear that that sort of protects us from the world, it is a harsh world, you know, all joking aside about about what it looks like politically and what it might look like for the challenges of this world. Uh, you know, my kids are living in a community where there was just another shooting in a school. And it, it, it means that the world feels very ugly, feels very uh, the, uh, antagonistic. And, and I think if you peel that away, what you find underneath that surface is actually a core value. It's a human value. It's also a Jewish value. We, you know, the, the value that, that we strive for when we talk about specifically kidney donation is obviously pikuach nefesh, the, the value of saving life or prioritizing life over everything else. But there's also a value in Jewish tradition, in a place where there are no menches, human beings, we are told to strive to be menches, to be good human beings. And that's really what we're talking about. This isn't, this isn't strange Torah, right? This is not a way out there. This is basic humanity. Be good people. Take care of other people. So the question I have for you is, how do we do that? How do we, how do we help people get to that in their lives? Yeah. I agree with every word you just said. Your Torah is speaking my truth as well. Look, 
I think you just hit the nail on the head. These horrible examples of evil and mean-spiritedness, like, for example, the shooting that you're grappling with in your uh, region right now, um, those are real, but they are not the majority reality around us. The majority reality around, and, and I say this as well to the Jewish community, yes, there's anti-Semitism and there are people who hate us, but most people are not anti-Semites and most people don't hate us. And so to answer your question, I think, yeah, in a place where there are no human beings, no mentions strive there, especially to be human. And also another quote that comes to my mind is Olam Chesed Yibaneh, that the world needs to be founded on and built on Chesed, that, that core Jewish value of loving kindness and the easiest way to do that, it seems so trite and obvious, but it's just to do it. When Aunt Paula looked at me that night from her hospital bed and said, what are you asking me? Why am I doing this? How could I not do this? I'd like to think that we all could become that person who, when given the choice between doing something kind and giving and loving or not, would just intuitively say, of course, I'm going to do the kind thing. We're not there yet. But I agree with you that, that our Jewish tradition gives us the opportunity to do it in every single case. I can't think of an example where doing the kind thing, doing the loving thing, isn't doing the right thing. Yeah, and, but we know it's not always easy, right? The rabbis knew it wasn't always easy. They talked about Yetzer Tov, the good inclination, and Yetzer Hara, the evil inclination. And it is much easier to be in that challenging moment with another human being to allow the evil inclination to take over. But what you're saying, and I think it's an important takeaway for the listeners today, is you just have to seek going deeper into what you know is right and just push down that negative or evil that's in the world and seek out what I think is light and goodness and kindness and hope. Because in the end, it's always better, right? We, we, we love what it feels like to have people in our lives that are kind and good. So can we just be kind and good? Is that, is that something that we can make happen? I think the answer is it has to be. I agree. I agree. Thank you for saying that. So I, I just want to ask this personally. As you have uh, taught your own children, as you are a husband, as you're a spiritual leader in your community, uh, can you just talk for one last minute here about what your commitment is towards that value in the next short term and long term? How do you see that playing out in your own personal life? Yeah, I, you know, it's funny. I'll start with my work, like your work, which can be all consuming. Um, I, it is my mission. I'm not always good at it, by the way. I, I'm very human and flawed in my work, but I am, it is my mission to remind the people with whom I work and the people who we serve in our community, in our congregation, and in the Jewish community at large, that it's, as you said a minute ago, it's always easier to be kind and filled with joy and optimism and hope. Um, and so a very real simple thing. It's just the, it's like exercise. You can think a lot about it. I do, by the way, I think a lot about it, but actually doing it actually feels good. And so you have, we have to exercise these muscles of kindness and joy and love and optimism and hope and use them instead of the muscles of laziness and angriness and hostility, which are there also. And if we, if we don't use the joyous good muscles, the muscles of chesed, the others will just snap into place and fill the, the, the space. I, I also would say, ultimately, it all begins with us individually. And so answering your question about personal, family, you know, friendships, it's being, it's simply being aware of this challenge. And so, again, trying to exercise those muscles to work against my own instinctive tendency to want to be grumpy or to be mean spirited, which, you know, I struggle with that, like all of us do, but to actually exercise those muscles of chesed every, every waking moment, whenever we possibly can. 
I, I so appreciate that analogy. I think it's a perfect way for people to think about this practice. And in the spirit of what you just talked, uh, I just want to take a minute to share my gratitude for our relationship. I think that over the last many years, sharing a profession, sharing a life, it has been exciting to be your brother, to grow into this adult relationship. I'm really grateful for you. I'm grateful for our connection. And I'm really thankful that, uh, that we have been able to build what we have together. So uh, I love you and I'm proud of where we are at this stage in our lives. Thanks, Josh. I feel the same way. I love you too. And I'm really grateful, not only for this brief momentary opportunity to share 18 minutes uh, waking up to life together, but you know, I'm grateful that we've had many years uh, waking up, sometimes together, usually not, but spiritually together. And uh, I'm, I'm really proud of you. And I care deeply about you and your family as well. And uh, I love you too. Thank you. So uh, you spoke about coming to the end of our 18 minutes together. We are almost there, but I end each of these podcasts asking my guests to share, if you would, uh, something outside of our conversation so far, just maybe a book that you're reading, something that has uh, brought meaning to your life, a television show, something where you have found uh, personal meaning in these most recent days and weeks. Well, I'll, I'll mention to you something you and I have discussed frequently over the last few years. Um, I've been reading um, and just finished actually reading uh, the new book by Daniel Sokach, the uh, CEO of the New Israel Fund, um, a magnificent beautiful primer on the Israel-Palestinian conflict called Can We Talk About Israel? A Guide for the Curious, Conflicted, and something else. I don't remember the exact subtitle. I, I highly recommend it to everybody. Daniel, as you know, is a fellow Gucci alumni from the Goldman Union Camp Institute in uh, Indiana, but more importantly, is doing magnificent work. And his insights actually relate to what we were talking about today. I know I shouldn't have connected them, but he, he approaches the Israel-Palestinian conflict with the same core value, which is our Jewish value of chesed and love and kindness and respect. And I really recommend it. It's, it's had a profound impact on me the last couple of weeks. And, uh, Fantastic. That's a great recommendation and actually a great suggestion for a future guest on the podcast. So that's fantastic. I'm, I'm hosting him tomorrow night. Oh, that, amazing. So mention the podcast and hopefully he'll join me soon. Dan, I'll be reaching out to you in, in, in the coming weeks. Jim, Rabbi Jim Bennett from Sheremeth in St. Louis, Missouri. Thank you for being my brother. Thank you for being a guest on the podcast. Uh, I really appreciate your time. So for all of you who are watching and listening, we've come to the end of another episode of Waking Up to Life with Rabbi Josh. Until next time, I hope that you will find meaning in the relationships you have, that you will, as we learned today, bring kindness into the world. Until then, I hope you will continue waking up to life. <laughs>